morning. Are you coming in then? Good morning. I've got a smile on my face because we've got a cracking show for you today. We really have. We've got Suggs from Madness is here. Yeah. Should be bouncing around like this. He'll be dropping by the house and taking into a plate of waffles and as well as a classic cocker van. Uh, my Spanish adventures will be taking me to Madrid while we're exploring the capital's many culinary delights. Alicia Vasey will be back as well. Uh, recently got engaged. The superstar Alicia Vasey with more advice of how to get free food you can forage for yourselves. And I'll be teaching you the ins and outs of cooking haddock and smoked haddock in this week's Little Masterclass. And that's not all, because I'm joined by two top chefs that I found just wandering down the road, uh, yeah. who are both legendary figures of the food world. It's the brilliant Daniel Galmatian, Cyrus Toniwala. <laughs> Wonder to have you back, gentlemen. So, you. so you're cooking for us, of course. Uh, Cyrus, what are you going to be doing? What are you going to make? So I am going to <clears throat> make an Indianized version of, actually, it's an Anglo-Indian version of the shepherd's pie. Right. So we're going to do a mince with a few spices in it. Okay. And top it with a mash that's seasoned with chilies and cumin. Okay. And we're going to bake it in the oven. Sounds pretty good. Are we going to go classically French for you? Or... We are. We are. But Funny that, a, Daniel, isn't it? it? <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough. With it, well, the season of a uh, wing, skate wing. Bang. Skate is, I mean, that's <clears> bang is on season. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. This year, problem, isn't it? Perfect. And I'm going to do a twist on it. I'm going to be <clears throat> doing a batter with chili, garlic, and a little bit of fresh parsley, and just boiled potatoes with chili. Very simple, but. So a little bit of spice with skate. Okay. Chili is going spice. Indian. Well, exactly. Well, well, like, it... Maybe ah. I saw it because you know, <laughs> exactly. I could do something. You know, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very we'll much. give it very a go. Kind of He's of really from Watford, to yeah. be honest with you, Cyrus, yeah. but there we go. Yeah. Uh, we're kicking things off today with a fondue recipe that I'm making with some amazing Gouda cheese uh, that we've got a beautiful supplier down in Cornwall that I'm going to introduce you to in a minute. So, first of all, that kind of bit is the last bit, but the first bit is what we're going to serve with it, how we're going to do it. And the key to this one, really, is we're going to break this all up in, and, and then have this as sort of individual bits that are all brought together. So I'm going to take some bread over here and I'm going to make these sort of bacon croutons to go with it. Wow. So think yeah. of this as this hot <laughs> cheese fondue that I'm going to make with this amazing cheese. But then rather than just take bread and do it, I'm going to take this bit of bread over here and we're going to wrap the bread in pancetta. Mm. Ah. So you just take the slices of pancetta and wrap them all up like that. And then we're going to fry them and roast them off in the oven. Oh, so then ah. you can oh, just can dump them all in, in, if that's all right. Very healthy. Well, of course, of course it is, Cyrus. Of course, yeah. Of course, yeah. What, what do you mean? We're dish number one of this show. Yeah. It's all, you know, I like to follow a theme in 2024, but where we left off in 1976. That's the one, but we take this and you just wrap it all up like that and we're going to roast it all off and serve it with these amazing vegetables. Because I know you've got your eye on this beautiful cheese that's in front of us over here, so I shan't let you wait any longer because I, I can see the gentleman over there just keeping you out. You can't no, wait any longer to dive into this. We can't you know. wait any longer. You know, exactly, so we'll cheese. introduce you to where this comes Come from. So this is going to Lanreth in Cornwall to speak to Jill Spearings uh, from the Cornish Gowder Company. Uh, Jill, wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, yes, great stuff, yeah, thank you. And, and, and what an amazing story this, first of all. So before I get the guys to dive into the cheese, Tell us about the amazing story, particularly of you, your upbringing, your, your, your family and your parents. How did it all start and how did you end up in Cornwall? Yeah, so um, I'm originally from the Netherlands. Uh, my dad's uh, been a farmer his entire life. He wanted to start milking cows. And in the Netherlands, uh, when the quota system came in, it was just unaffordable to do. And the UK was only producing 50% of its own milk. So um, he decided to come to the UK and start, uh, start farming. And uh, came down here and absolutely loved it, uh, and eventually was able to buy the farm here uh, and start milking cows. Um, I was six years old when we moved over. I've got a sister that was seven, and my brother was eight. And uh, and yeah, we came over here and started dairy farming. And then after sort of well, what is it? After about fourteen years of farming, the milk price was never very good, and they just couldn't afford to keep going. The farm wasn't viable anymore. This was the, you actually um, the, your parents had it up for sale, though, didn't they? Really, that's yeah. Yeah, they had up for sale, they had up for sale, and, um, yeah, just things weren't going really well. But, you know, my brother and sister were both at university. Um, my parents really didn't want to stop farming, but it just wasn't viable to carry on going. I was at school at the time, and I just decided that, uh, yeah, we were going to diversify the farm, try and add value, 
And my parents, um, you know, they've made gouda cheese before in the Netherlands. My grandma used to make it during the war. My cousin makes it in the Netherlands. So it's just it's been part of our family. And uh, yeah, I just decided that we were going to start making cheese. And, and your, your, to, this was to, to, basically your, your parents had the, the farm. They were about to sell it. You and yeah. you and this, the, the, the kids came along and went, no, 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 no you're not going to do that, not going to do that. We're yeah. going to diversify and make, make a cheese from your homeland in yes. Cornwall. Yeah. I mean, that's a brave, that's a brave, yeah. brave room. Brave, brave. It's like a Frenchman yeah, well, coming I... over here and making, making some Comte. <laughs> exactly, Comte over here. It's a brave room. You know? Yeah, wow. well, I mean, uh, I mean, 17 is stupid, right? So... 17 is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it was a good idea, and uh, thought I'd give it a go. Um, and it, yeah, it's paid off. It's uh, it's been really good, you know. It's, uh, kept the farm going, and um, yeah, well, you've yeah, got just... you've got. I mean, you've got great pasture down there for one. That's what I mean. Shoot, that's the first thing you need, isn't it? Really, for great great quality dairy. That's why Devon and Cornwall. That is the first you, thing. You've got yeah. great pasture. Yeah. So, <laughs> so literally, yeah. So my, my brother's an agronomist, so he looks after the soil, the crops, the seeds, the plants. And uh, we are a 95% grass-fed uh, diet to the cows. Wow, so, um, yeah, it's all yeah. about the grass. That's, that's where all the flavour is in. That's where the sugar's in. So that's where that, that sweetness comes from. And, uh, yeah, it's all about the grass. It's all about the, uh, you know, the climate that we have down here. It's perfect for, so in for, terms for of, grass, for the cows. In terms of making it, do you make it exactly the same way as you do in the Netherlands? Is it, is it exactly the same way, the same cattle, or do you have to use yeah, a different breed? Yeah. Yeah, no, so we've got uh, Holstein Frisian cows. Um, my, ped my parents took the pedigree on from the farmers who they bought the farm off um, and kept that pedigree going, so it's their own pedigree herd. Mm, and beautiful. it's very much a, a Holstein Frisian cows, so it's a Dutch breed. And, um, and then, yes, we use the same sort of uh, techniques as the traditional Dutch farmers do. Um, so obviously we're not like a big factory, but the proper farm, and farm cheese that you get in the Netherlands, that's what we stick to, that's the recipe we stick to. So it's all handmade. Um, well, it's only, you know, the, the it's proof really is back. the proof is in the pudding because you kindly sent us a massive array of, of oh, different wow. of your it different looks, style of gouda that you've got over here. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to yeah. start off. Where would we start off in terms of tasting? You're the specialist on this. Where where would I get the chefs to start off? Start with the mild cheese. Start with the three start month with old the mild one. one. Yeah, but that's definitely the, the that's sort of like the base of all of our cheeses. That's what we're um, you know we, we start with that. You can really you know it, it's it's easier to get an old cheese right, but it's harder to get a young cheese right. But the, the flavour of like the grass, the, the seasonality that we have, it really comes through on the mild. Uh, yeah, it's creamy. just fantastic everyday cheese. Yeah. So how are you how are you making this? How does how does this differ for for say a cheddar? How 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 do you get that? How do you get the texture? How do you get the taste? What how do you make this different? So the main thing is that it's a wash curd cheese. So we basically um, we pasteurise the milk first. We then uh, add cultures to make the to make the milk sour. We then use rennet to trigger the calcium to hold the fat and protein together, and then we use knives to separate the whey from the curds. And when most of our recipes kind of slap bang between making a brie and making a cheddar, so we cut the curd, we separate the whey from the curds about halfway between what you would do if you were doing a, a, a brie or a cheddar. And we also um, take about moisture, so we wash the curd. And again, we take out about halfway between a cheddar and a, uh, and a brie of how much moisture to take out. So it's fantastic because it means that you can age the cheese on for a really long time. So you can mature the cheese on for up to like three years. Um, but you can also get a real good depth of flavor as a, as a mild cheese. So they, they do a, a bit the same system than when they make Conte. Yeah. So they can match you into all these yep. years. Like up Conte, to, yeah. Up to 36. <clears throat> Months. Well, we're but, going to get to that as I mean, well because wow. we're going to jump from there because you've got mature and extra mature over here yeah. as well. So what? If, what? Yeah. Have you, what? So while these guys are tasting, what have you got? What, what's happening behind you? So for anybody that's not familiar with this, you're, oh, you're, you're <laughs> the, in the aging room. What's what's happening behind you? Do you have to rotate this cheese every day? Is it every week or? Yeah. So we. Um, so the cheeses that are right behind me, they are ten months old. Um, and they don't need uh, turning quite as often. So because they're already a year old or, or 10 months old, they don't need as uh, cleaning and turning as often. But basically, when the cheeses first come out the brine tanks, they then go onto the shelves. We then uh, wax the cheeses, so we coat them. And then once they've finished uh, uh, being waxed, we then have to clean and turn them every fortnight. And we have to do that for quite a while. But then the older the cheese gets, the less, less we have to clean and turn them. So... 
the mature ones behind me only get done once a month, really. Because the mature one, it change, you can see the salt crystals in, in the mature one. When I taste yeah, this, it's it. kind of like a, an age, like a proper age Parmesan. That yeah, that's it. It's like the, it's the calcium lactate that you get in there, so you get a lovely, nice crunch to it. And, uh, yeah, the, the, it's much richer. You've still got that moisture content, so a lot of cheeses that age can be really dry and crumbly, whereas that, that cheese has still got a lot of moisture depth in there, um, but so rich, so full of flavour. So, yeah, it's just the... Uh, that's the, the mature is... You know, that's our award winner. That's yeah, the... It's, it's, the, it's, 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 <laughs> the cheese is not better than what your cousin makes in... In the Netherlands, is it? <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to ask uh, others. I can't say that. <laughs> but he's, he's laughing yeah. at the same time. It's yeah. really, it's, <laughs> it, it is. It, and, and tell me about, because you, you started out doing this for restaurants and delis and, and, and yeah. hotels and that kind of stuff. But, you know, in, in the pandemic, you, you then had to diversify, like many, many people as well. Yeah. And that yeah, led so you to what you're doing now. You know, we were... I think we were selling about three to four tonne a month uh, of That's cheese, wow. going to all to restaurants and delis and farm shops. And uh, it was all being cut off the off the wheel, so whole wheels, and then people were cutting it themselves and using it themselves. And during COVID, that all went to nothing. It just went to zero. And we had to quickly develop an online uh, website like so many businesses. And as soon as we launched that, it just took off. Well, this is exactly the reason why we do this every week. Mm, yeah. It's because of, we set this all up in the pandemic because to help suppliers out, they had no avenue to supply. And it's just, I think this is the key to it, though, really. I mean, people's embraced it and loved it ever since then because yeah. you, I w these guys wouldn't have thought that this was produced down in Cornwall. How have the Cornish taken to this then? Because uh, you've, oh, you've opened it up on the doorstep. <laughs> They love it. They love it. We've got uh, we got we, we started out with just supplying chefs. So um, you know, when I had my first cheeses, we um, well, the very first place we took it to was a whole ruined WI group, and that's where I got my first cheese. That's the toughest uh, crowd. But... Trust me, that's it. I've... <laughs> that's <the toughest> crowd. <laughs> <laughs> once we had mastered them, once we got them, everyone else fell into place. But uh, easy we... after that. Easy. Easy after that. Yeah, uh, we I had mean... to then go to <laughs> chefs. Chefs was the next big biggest thing. So. Yeah, lots of chefs across Cornwall, and uh, we were using lots of it. We are using the extra mature as like a Parmesan replacement, and yeah, yeah. So on your on your uh, mild and mature, what is the difference on months between the mild uh, and the, the mature? The mild, is, the mild is three months, and yeah. the mature that you've got there is 10 months. Yeah, I mean, there's already a big difference, and the, but the mature, yeah. the saltiness is already beautiful in it. Huh? Yes. I love yeah, the yeah, texture. Yeah. It's changed so much from a creamier to much nutty, salty, it, it? It changes yeah. massively, doesn't it? Massive, massive, massive difference. <clears throat> it's fantastic. Yeah. But tell, uh, I mean, and for our viewers, a brick, a, a wheel that you make, how much does it shrink from starting to the mature stage? Well, the, um, we lose, um, from, from the mild to the mature, we probably lose around a kilo and a half of, of weight, of moisture. Um, so the cheeses start off at about, uh, well, 12, 13 kilos. And they weigh about 11 and a half by the time they get to uh, to the mature stage, Indeed. and then they lose another kilo by the time they get to the extra mature. Yeah. So they lose a lot of moisture. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, at that stage the color uh, look like uh, um, the Comté or, or the Parmesan. The, the, the color change to orangey, yeah. which are really yes. nice, and it gives you so much yeah. nuttiness. It's I'm interesting not... you saying that. It's like yeah. the sort of the, the, I suppose it's like the distillery equivalent to the angel share. Mm. That yep, when you yeah. leave it in the barrel, that it's, yeah. your, your, your drink is disappearing mm. up into the angels. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> the same thing. That's your profit going through the roof. <laughs> yeah, literally. Literally, 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 literally through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> but it's no. legit. So, uh, See, the, in, the, the, yeah, go on. The, che the, the cheeses behind me, they, um, they're all, yeah, they're all 10 months old. They're all around uh, 11 kilos. And each one of them has uh, around 120 litres of milk uh, in them, sort of thing. So... And then we have about 8,000 of these wheels, and uh, each one of them, yeah, has 150 Eight. litres of... Well, 120 litres. Hold on, so you just skipped that. 8,000 of these wheels. You, yep. So there's more than just yeah. you and your family now. You've had to employ more... Because just yes, to turn yes, this cheese yeah. over is one, one thing in itself. Yeah, <laughs> well, we... Uh, <laughs> our shelves are still looking pretty empty, so we're struggling to actually get these shelves filled. Um, at the moment, all of the milk goes into the cheese from the farm, so um, we sell almost, almost none of so it. So does on that Sunday, mean that it is... It is only your milk, or you have to bo have to borrow to buy milk outside we, your we farm. We only use, yeah, we only use our own milk, so okay. um, we're very yeah. we're very much at capacity because of that reason. Okay, um, so, so that yeah. means you need to kind of uh, 
not limit your production, but make sure that uh, then you can produce for all yeah. your cheese. Actually, so, so yeah, tell, me, tell me, tell me, what 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 do the parents think? What do the, what did the parents think when you were doing this? First of all, do they think you're absolutely yeah, crazy? I mean, and what do they think now? <laughs> no, they <laughs> they were very supportive right from the start. They never wanted to uh, they never wanted to stop farming. So it was more a case of the fact that if the farm wasn't viable, it wasn't because they didn't love farming. So. Um, you know, they uh, they were very supportive and they thought, you know, if we're going to lose it, we might as well carry on going a bit longer if there's a small chance that we'll succeed and keep going. So they were supportive from day one. And, uh, yeah, I think that's... Uh, I, I presume they're very proud and stuff. But, well, uh, it's different. Yeah. hopefully I'm going to do this justice because I'm just going to get get to finish off this now. So I've melted the cheese. So the cheese has gone in there with some full-fat creme fraiche. It's gone out there with some Riesling wine I put in there as well. I'm going to thicken this with a touch of corn flour, and then this is your nice little fondue that, that goes with it. So hopefully you can see on that board that we've got like a, a, a selection of, I've got some chorizo, I've got the bacon, uh, bread, I've got the roasted potatoes in there, little baby potatoes that are pre-cooked that you just roast in the oven. And I'm just going to thicken this up. What do you, what do you think of it? Because you've got different flavoured ones well, as well. I was, I was going to ask uh, why the, in Gouda, sorry, my French pronunciation, you put the O in orange instead of... Oh, man. my uh, my fiance actually said that uh, to me yesterday, and she's changed it. So now the uh, the the O in uh, Cornwall is going to be orange, so that it's Gouda in uh, in Cornwall. <laughs> so <she has> <laughs> okay. so we got a limited edition version. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before they went yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. We'll keep that. Exactly. Well, I wish you all the very best to look with it. Thank Hopefully, you. I've Thank done it justice much. over here as well. But there you have it. My nice little bit of assortment oh. with uh, with a Gouda. Well, fondue. And no need to go to Savoie. It's, it's going to taste that. amazing, but there we have it. Easy as that. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Come on then, guys. I'm not bringing it over to you, whoa, whoa, whoa. but you're armed with one of these each. I'm armed with it. <laughs> ah, fantastic. What do you want? You're, you're going to go for the bacon. Yeah, go on, go on. Go on of course. Go on. Bacon. Has to be done. Go on. Go on. Don't keep right, right, right in. Right in. Right. You get that. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> He's being greedy. It's falling off, yeah? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, this is, sorry, who's sorry. Who's being greedy? You Nobody saw that. No, no, no. It just, I just want <laughs> to... Hold it like that's, that. That's what you do around the table, you see, and you, you, that's why we all make a mistake. Go on then. Go on then, Cyrus. Go, go for it. Mm. Go on. Very good. Come on, stop troubling me. Ah. What's up, Mr. Galmish? What's not to lie? You've got something for everybody, eh? Gorgeous. Yeah. Nice cheese. Actually, beautiful. I might have another bit. Go on, have another yeah. bit. Yeah. Right, these two will be cooking for us a little bit later on the show. They'll be joined in the kitchen by Madness star Suggs very shortly. Don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're taking in the sights of Spain's capital city on the latest leg of my food adventures. Not small I'll see you in a bit. Yeah. James doesn't do I'm small pieces. I'm going to dunk a carrot. Wow. Welcome back. Now, I'll be showing you how to cook haddock in this week's Diddle Master Class. And music icon Suggs will be dropping by the kitchen very shortly. OK, it's time for more cooking now. So we're heading off to Spain on another one of my favourite food adventures. And this week, I've made it to Madrid. And I'm soaking in the sights and the sounds and the flavours of one of the greatest cities in the world. Enjoy this one. My voyage of Spanish discovery continues and I'm loving every minute of the journey. So welcome to central Spain. Now, I'm heading towards Madrid. This is a city I've never visited, and it's a place where, to be honest with you, driving is not a good idea. So I'm going to dump the car off, which is a good idea as well, because I need to get changed. Because the bit you don't see on camera, the unglamorous bit that you don't see on the camera, is I've just spilt my drink all over myself and it's not a pretty sight. My next stop is going to be quite a milestone. 
from Castile and Lyon. I've driven about 180 miles southeast to get to Spain's dazzling capital, Madrid, where the sun shines on average 300 days a year. And some say the locals are nicknamed cats because they like to party all night. This is quite a monumental moment on this trip, really, because right now, in the centre of this square, I'm now stood bang in the centre of Spain. Bang in the middle. It's quite cool, isn't it? Thought to be founded in the 9th century, it's one of the biggest cities in Europe. Now, most people who know me know that I don't really do cities. Whenever I go into a city, I always want an exit strategy to get out. But you can't help but be fascinated by the place. Every little street corner that you go to, and Madrid is just spectacular, the old and the new. And when I was in France, I visited a chicken museum. Here in Madrid, we've got a ham museum. Brilliant. They're just as obsessed as I am about food here, and I'm ready to tuck in. Now, I've been told there are many things to try on my trip, but in Madrid, you have to try a calamari fried sandwich, apparently. This is Madrid's answer to a kebab shop, but they serve calamari in a bun, and people go mad for them. Just look at the queues. They're churning them out. Now, you're probably wondering why this became popular. And they said because of rail and the introduction of rail that it brought fish to Madrid in huge volumes. And that's where it stayed ever since. And this, this has become the staple, the ultimate street food of Madrid. It's nothing fancy, to be honest with you. It's just squid in a bun. But the, the batter is made with a touch of flour, and just flash fried in olive oil. Don't eat anything else. No sauce, no lemon, nothing. This is really tasty, to be honest. Who knew Madrid appears to be full of hidden gems? It's a sociable city too, and it's full of surprises. Now, this is definitely the coolest thing I've seen in Madrid. We have a guy that comes to my restaurant that sharpens the knives for the chefs about once a month. Never outside on a moped with a generator. Love it. Maybe I need to add a moped to the mobile kitchen. Like any city, there are countless restaurants here, and you can get pretty much anything you want. And I've been told about one that keeps things simple, but it's packed to the rafters day in and day out. Casa del Abuelo opened its doors in 1906 and has been specialising in prawns since the 1940s. And they cook up 38 tonnes of these little fellas every year. And it attracts a lively crowd. Where are you from? I'm uh, from Belgium. I'm from Belgium. Belgium. Yes, 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 yes. Are you, are you famous? So you have more frit in Belgium, no? Famous? Well, fish. I think Why? you're famous. All around Spain. Why? Why? Oh, that's it. So this place is all about characters, you see. But this is it. The famous gambas with garlic. Now, there are lots of places to eat this. I don't think there's any place as busy as this spot, though. It's delicious. They always serve it with bread that you can dunk it in afterwards. A nice cold beer. As you can see from this, it's a bit hot. Do you know what this is what food should be about, though? Experiencing new things is my first time to Madrid. It's an amazing place, it really is.
Madrid was really special. I do love Spain. It's spectacular. Right, Cyrus Toddy Waller will be cooking for us very shortly. And top forager, she's back, Alicia Vasey. She'll be dropping by the house very shortly. But I'll see you here after the break when I'll be serving up bacon and potato waffles for madness legend Suggs. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, the very talented Daniel Galmish is going to be cooking for us a little bit later. And forager Alicia Vasey will be dropping by the house very shortly. But first, it's an honour, and a true honour, and I mean that, uh, to be here with a man who fronted one of the country's most iconic bands, and they've churned out hit after hit after hit over the last four decades. I remember, because I've been listening to it for as long as that. It's the brilliant Suggs! <laughs> Welcome to the house. Welcome Cheers, to the mate. house. Good to see you. We've never seen so many people in here. Have the people I don't even know <laughs> as well. Uh, and all this for a fried breakfast and you. Because <laughs> uh, I was reading all your favourite sort of foods as well like that, and I thought, I've got to pick this one. I've got to do a, a fancy version of a fried... Well, it's not really a fancy. It's, it's a fried breakfast with a waffle. That's all right. A full English, yeah, I'm sorry, but that is still one of my favourite meals, yeah, yeah. I mean... Not every day of the week, but, you know. But every now and then. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some interesting stuff going down here, James. Well, yeah, we've got, yeah, we got yeah, sausages, yeah. we've got sausages, yeah. mushrooms. It's the same thing, apart from the fact that we're going to do these bacon and potato waffles. So rather than yeah. hash browns, we're going to do waffles with it as well. And Excellent. a little bit of flavoured butter. That's about it, really. But the sausages going in the pan, we've got the, the uh, tomatoes on in here. I'm going to cook it with mushrooms and some nice little butter as well. So first of all, where do we start? I'll tell you where we start. We start with what, what right now is. It's got to be massive congratulations, because... Your album, this is the album, what, 13th album? Yes, indeed. Is this actually Lucky 13th? Lucky for some, yeah. This, this, is, this is number one, your first number one album. Yes, very strangely. I mean, Which deserves yeah. a round of applause, to be honest. <laughs> Not just the third album, but, but uh, the first number one album. <laughs> all these strangers that follow <laughs> exactly. me out of the pub are all applauding. Exactly. That's nice. Yeah. But, yeah, no, we had to check ourselves on the internet, and it, it apparently is the first number one. We had a lot of number twos and threes and all that. But they were in the days of Blondie and the Pretenders and people that were Abba and Michael Jackson were much bigger than us. So finally, we got a little bit of space. But, but um, it's funny, I was talking to you earlier without sort of dominating the whole conversation. Um, you were talking about reading that we, was, we, we had market stalls in Camden Town when we were kids. And I must say, in fairness to BMG, our record company, we're determined to push this. Taylor Swift was right up our backside. Drake was coming <laughs> round the corner. He said, we just need to flog a few more albums. Yeah. So they set us up a stall in Camden Town. Yeah, and I'm standing here flogging albums thinking, now this is life in full circle. <laughs> <laughs> That's 40 years ago when we was flogging albums. Well, I mean, Cam Camden's, I mean, close to you as well, close to your heart, Camden, and, and, and the whole back then, we're talking back then, 40 odd years ago. It, the Coco Club's still around, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it wasn't, wasn't it called, was it the Camden? Well, it changed names a load of times, yeah. It was the Camden Palace, then the Music Machine. But when we were kids, there were probably 12 or 14 different venues that you could get gigs in in those days. So yeah. you could go out and see a band every night. I mean, it was tremendous. And there was bands <laughs> like, you know, The, the Who, the, I mean, The, the Stones. Everyone you can it, think yeah. of, yeah. I mean, a friend of mine had a, a meeting with, I think it was Liz Truss or something, when she was the head of entertainment and, and he went where do you think these bands started she had all the gold discs of like cold play and you know uh, yeah. they all started in the pubs of camden town like everybody did in those days well i remember yeah. Cold because Col Col coldplay launched their one of their albums at x y i think they did it in camden town this is a small well, it's 1500 seater but iconic venue as well but that, that whole ethos back then you, your band you weren't part of the original lineup were you there was there was three part three <laughs> yeah, yeah is that right it's... yeah there was a band called the north london invaders and, and i kind of knew them as friends but the singer that they had um wasn't very good and, and and they asked me i'd never sung in my life before but i was coming out of a cinema singing i've been to see that film american graffiti you know and i was yeah. singing rock around the clock or something and they said, do you fancy trying out? And so I got the job as singer, much to the amazement of everyone, including me. So what were you doing when that... What were you doing for, for a living? Well, funny enough, I was working in a butcher's at that time, of all the things. Yeah. But I, I, I knew that wasn't going to be a career. I mean, you know that apprenticeship business, which you know very well. Yeah. And, Butchers had a whole hierarchy, you know, the master butcher, the... Da, 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 it takes da, ages da, da, to get da, da, there, all the way... And yeah. I was right at the bottom. 
And but then the band started to take off quite quickly, yeah. Well, it does take off quite quickly because you were, you were doing gigs and, and, you know, not hand to mouth, but, you know, 11 quid a week and that kind of stuff. And then it suddenly... What was the catalyst that suddenly went boom? Well, there were two things. One was that there was a kind of scene, the two-tone scene, which was a special selector, and we were kind of involved in that a little bit. We had a single that got to number 16 in the charts. And then Stiff Records, who had um, Ian Jury, Elvis Costello, a lot of the people that we liked at the time, signed us up. And our next couple of singles just hit the charts, really, in quick succession. The apocryphal story is that I suddenly got £30,000, and I was saying, I don't know what to do with the £30,000, honestly. <laughs> From £11 a week to £30,000. And I was trying to give some of it back, but I certainly wouldn't do that anymore. But going... Go... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. But going, going back, going back before the band and everything else, your, your childhood, your, your mum... Yeah. She was huge... You were a singer. Yeah, yeah. She Is that was... where you... That, that's obviously where you got your inspiration. Well, I had no intention to be a singer, but, yeah, she was a jazz singer around the clubs of Soho. <clears throat> but, like... A lot of my friends who had parents who were musicians or singers, it was all terribly embarrassing, cos you go in the pub and if there was a piano, you'd think, oh, no, here we go. Here we... We're, never, <laughs> right. we're not getting out of it for about <laughs> six hours. Um, but she was a very good singer, yeah. She never really made it in any great consequence. But I suppose it must have rubbed off in some way uh, when you look at the history of what, what, what happened to me. But I'm going, I'm going just after your childhood as well, because you, that, that was a... You didn't have the easiest, easiest of yeah. childhoods, let's be fair. And then you got to graph for everything. And I think that's the same thing with your band, really, because you've, you know, you've done the groundwork, and that was notoriously tough. Because a lot of things... music industry is different, as we know now. I mean, you've, you've seen it over decades. It's yeah, no, for sure, for sure, for sure. I mean, you know, I got thrown out of the band briefly because I wasn't taking it seriously enough. I was going to the football on Saturdays when that was the main day of rehearsal. And then eventually one of the bands saw me on Match of the Day like that and I've, I've been talking about going to my auntie's funeral for the fourth week running and obviously <laughs> was not. So I got thrown out of the band and then I remember going to see him at a school in Camden and all the girls were down at the front like a scene from American Graffiti and I thought I should be up there, not down here. And that really was the turning point and I thought, no, you're right, now to start taking things seriously. Yeah, and so we started rehearsing four or five times a week. And we started to make progress, yeah. I mean, everybody was talking about having a band. You know, everyone had a boat and saxophone or a guitar and they were all going about with their, you know, berets and... <laughs> what's it, books in their pocket, you know. But your Jack image Carraway. as well, your image was unique for that, that sort of time as well. <clears throat> yeah, well, we kind of... You know, you kind of had punk, which was a lot of energy. But that was all sort of about tearing your clothes up and looking like you'd just come out of a hedge. <laughs> and we just got into... <laughs> suits that you could get from second-hand shops in Camden Town and created our own kind of little scene. And then the specials came along who were doing something very similar, which was that ska and reggae stuff, which was how we started. So we've got to talk about this album now, because this yeah. is album num uh, number 13. Tell us about this, because this has been, what, seven years? Yes, since you, And you were, you were actually going to, in the middle of, sort of, the pandemic, you were actually going to split up, you know? Yeah. I mean, like everybody, we were having a very hard time, you know, emotionally and, uh, you know, spiritually, politically. And then we started talking and then it's, it's always the same. When we get in a room together, making music is always the greatest healer. And you realise, you know, there's more that keeps us together than, than divides us, really, even though we want to kill each other most of the time. <laughs> but isn't that... That's that the same with, with successful bands like yourselves? Yeah. Because you look you've at... Got you've got to have Fleetwood that. Mac, you've got to have that... Adultery and, you know... So, so do you have people in the band, do you have, right, you're going to do the lyrics of this and you're going to do this? I guess there's not that. Like, you all just... It seems to me like you all just meet up in a room and stuff happens. <laughs> is that right? Well, well, everybody writes, which is unusual. I mean, you know, our, our keyboard player, Mike, said he felt sorry for the Beatles and the Stones because there's only two writers. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> there were six of us, <laughs> but not quite as good as them two. <laughs> But, no, we just... Everybody writes, and, and, and in, in different measures. Sometimes someone will have words, someone will have a tune, and we... But I remember when we started rehearsing this album, thinking, God, oh, blimey, are you sure this is any good? But bit by bit, it, it evolves, and, and everyone adds their parts, and given the players that we have, our saxophone player, Lee, Michael, Keeble, we've got very individual players, and it starts to sound like madness eventually. It does start to sound yes. like madness, cos yes. even after 40 years, you're about to witness this. Just have a listen to this. <laughs> Cheeks and a pair 
pair of wings Is this what mother gave him? He'll hear the angels sing On high for all to praise him God's gift And no one wants to know Lost it, never in any doubt, was it really? So, look, we just got in here. That's brilliant. You're going to stick around for the rest of the morning. We're going to talk more about the tour, which we, we're going to touch on a little bit later as well, because yes. you're, out, you're out back on the road. Yes, so just never stops, you know. I mean, our saxophone players keep saying, can, when, when can we retire? But, 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 but people could keep buying the tickets. <laughs> so, not complaining at all. No, the live stuff. We've got a load of festivals coming up this summer, yeah, which maybe we'll Because you, you, you notoriously turned around when you were younger and turned around and said, I'm not playing the, 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 those... those. <laughs> do, do you remember that? We're not playing the big venues. Yeah, either. you're not we're playing not... the big venues. You're not so... playing that sort of music again. Once, <laughs> once we've done that hit, we're not playing it again. No, no, that's you right. Must, you must think... Yeah, I, I... Well, no, that's right. I remember when I was 20-odd saying, there's no way I'll still be playing that baggy trousers when I'm an old man of 30. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, those days are long gone, as we all know. <laughs> that's looking good, James, mate. Yeah, it's yeah, the timing, well... innit, on a fry-up. <laughs> well, there we go. We're nearly there with our, yeah. our fry-up. We've got this. Uh, I've got my little bit of maple butter that I've got in here. Fried egg. And we just take our maple butter. All that in so there. you're getting into music now, I'm, I'm led to believe. I, I, I'm not a, told me. by any way... Well, I saw the 400 guitars in well, your <laughs> man cave, so you're obviously doing something, mate. Well, I just... I, <laughs> I, 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 I make a noise. That's what I like. <laughs> but I like doing it, and, and yeah. I, I, I get a sort of... a buzz, like, you get... I mean, you just get... Well, music always does, yeah, regardless of what... Level you're at, you know. Yeah, and do you know yeah. what? When I knew you were coming on, I just I, I was trying to remember. It just I remember me and my mates sort of banging into each other and everybody else in the pub when your music came on. <laughs> and now you're at my house, and now I'm cooking a fry up. How surreal is life? Um, and the, here you have it: a, a fry up for Suggs, nice and easy, with a nice little potato and bacon waffle. Done. Yeah. Easy as well. yeah. Right, there we have it. Thank you very much, mate. Not a bad starter, is it, really? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, it's the waffle I'm really intrigued by, the, yes. The, it's just, just... Not just a load of old waffle, you know. Yeah. Mmm. Well, Love it. And that's maple butter, yeah. Maple, maple butter with the bacon. Mmm. American style, isn't it? A pancake yeah. waffly business, yeah, lovely. You can't beat a fried fry breakfast, though. You can't beat... You can't. Is, can I just say, I've been doing this show, but... For, well, as you long know... as you've been making music, <laughs> I don't. I think that's the first breakfast I've ever made on national TV. Well, you know you've ruined today's show because everyone out there is just running out the door around to the local shop <laughs> to get some <laughs> <of> bacon. <laughs> exactly. You know that, mate. That's a point as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, right there we have. I'll be making a classic cogavan for Suggs later on in the show. Mm. We've got more classic French cooking on the way from Daniel Galmiche. That's coming up very shortly. But join us again after the break. When we've got Indian cooking on the menu with Cyrus Toddy Waller, he'll be giving the humble shepherd's pie an Indian makeover. I'll see you after the break. These are amazing. Mm. Welcome back. Now, still to come, I'll be teaching you everything you ever want to know about cooking haddock in this week's Little Masters. And Alicia Vasey will be here with more food. You can go out and forage for yourselves very shortly. But first, I'm here with the Frenchman Daniel Galmiche, and we're about to put his tolerance to spice to the ultimate test. You're not a great lover of spice, oh, are you? Not too much, no, because it's not a French thing to eat. Well, spice this man is really. the master at it. It's the but... godfather of Indian yes. spice and Indian cookery. It's Cyrus Tolliwalla. <laughs> great to have you back, Chief. N Always. Now, this, this recipe is amazing. It is amazing. This is a shepherd's pie with a difference. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's in my new book, Mr. Toriola's Bombay. Yeah. And uh, it's a simplified version of 
amongst the many things that we would normally add. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> it's, it goes very well. It does well. So it's classic shepherd's pie with, with lamb mince, but instead of using stock, you're using tomato, and then you've using still got your, the spice yeah. that is base. The mashed potato you want me to do separate, so... Yes, sir. The mashed potato should have uh, green chilli in it. Right. A bit of uh, uh, fresh coriander. Yeah. And, of course, crushed cumin. The rest is easy, the cream, the butter... So do you warm the much. potatoes up with the, the same things? You... Yeah, so what we would do normally, we'd beat some egg into the cream yeah. and then blend it into the potato. OK. And put the very finely then chopped coriander. that's what I'm going to do, then. Yeah. So, you, so you mix the egg egg as w into the potato... Egg it... yolk or whole egg? Well, whole egg into the cream. In India, we don't waste things, no? OK, that's fair enough. Love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love it. In you, there. You bet me chip. Yeah. Great. Egg and butter and all that kind of stuff. Sounds pretty good. So it starts off with starts off with this in the well. So tell everybody about your restaurant then, because your restaurant is is now near uh, City Airport. Very near I mean, behind City Airport in a sense. We we back the landing strip. Yeah. But uh, we are across from the XL. And just within yeah, minutes actually from the XL. So from the restaurant. What you see is Canary Wharf, and uh, it's not far, really. It's only about 10, 15 minutes from... That's, that's you, on, you know yeah, this, right? Yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm on control. I'll... Because yeah. I'll, I'll... I've had a bad experience with that before. <laughs> uh, I'll pilot the plane for you, yeah. all right? So, yeah. I'll do exactly the same, actually. I always ask which one is which one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't it's, know why. It's super hot, that's why, isn't it? Well, right? that's it, yeah. That's the key yeah. to it. Mm. So plenty of onions in this, first of all. This is what I love about Indian cookery. The onions, onions, onions. Do you still have... I remember visiting your kitchen. You still have one person just chopping onions the entire... Well, in the past, we used to use 200 kilos a week, you know? Wow. So there's a lot of onions. It's a lot of onions. We onion. still need a lot of onions. Yeah. But it's the base of a lot of dishes in Indian yeah. cuisine. Yeah. Because we don't have... Uh, we don't use... Uh, see, like I said, this one's a beast. So that heats that... up like a... Yeah, I've turned it down a bit. Turn that down a little bit. So you've got... This is... Shepherd's pie and you've got cinnamon. I've got cinnamon inside. Yeah. Of course, we would mostly in India they would use cassia bark. Okay. But uh, cinnamon. So just with the pan is to just a little fry this a bit. This is very unusual. I mean, to to put cinnamon in a in shepherd's pie. Oh, in but chili. Pie. Red chili. <laughs> Where does this affliction to chili come from? Is this this I've is from India? I've seen all India. getting it, including the seeds. I say, oh la la. <laughs> yes. Where did this come from then? Where, where was the where was the, the sort of the chili affliction from? Where was that from, from as well? Well, because my time when I lived in Singapore, right. Uh, that's why I discovered a little bit of more spicy food. Uh, the one I couldn't take was the one from Malaysia. I mean, I love laksa, but it's impossible for me to eat because it's too, I love Thai food, but it's very different in a country. When you eat Thai food in a country with the heat and everything and the way they do fresh and fragrant yeah. and really crunchy. The key to I it don't... is don't make mashed potato while you've bent over a pan that's got chili in it, because that's yes. really... Oh, my God, yeah, yes. go to the... But you've got long arms, James, you can manage it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lucky for I would then. not be able yeah. to manage that. <laughs> yeah. So is this based on something that you sort of made up in, in India, or is this just a... Just a... Uh, so this is quite historical, actually, in a sense. So if you were in India 200 years plus year ago, and... Uh, the, the men in the army, or the officers in the army, were very much attuned to having non-spicy, rather blandish British food. Yeah. And when they went in the evening to the gymkhanas or clubs after work, the Indian chefs would try very hard to convince them to eat Indian food. When that did not happen, what they started to do was take British classics and convert them or change them a little bit. Yeah. You need to stop and Indianize it. a bit. <laughs> I'm going to so, put the whole thing. <laughs> that's how some of these classic things... Um, if you remember, we made the other country captain once with the whole shoulder of land. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and we served... I mean, it was the first uh, lunch for Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee, and we had made that up. So now, another thing uh, is that when people add mince to a pan, they normally, if you're making a bolognese or whatever, you normally end up making lumps with the mince. By adding a bit of water, I cool my pan down a bit, and then I don't get lumps, OK? So you break it down more easily because the pan has cooled down. The heat will pick up again. Now, I've learned a new way of doing mash with this because this is a bit, This is chili, yeah. coriander. What is this? Your Crushed pan? cumin. Crushed cumin. Crushed cumin. In here, salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. No 
Of course, good old butter and this, and the taste is amazing. And it's, it's a taste absolutely delicious, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So, in we go with tin tomatoes. Tin tomatoes, best, saves yeah. time. Yeah. And uh, they are just as good, and actually, the quality is always you good. You get though. better because you get it straight out of Italy and some, you get yeah. some amazing flavour in the tin. And I take it this year you're going to be doing, for anybody who wants to see you out and about, you're going to be doing festivals and demonstrations all over the place. All over the place, as usual. As, as usual. usual. Do you still, are you still doing the pub in the park thing? Are you still doing all we that? We are, but uh, this year, because it's much reduced, yeah. we are doing pub in the park, and I don't know if we'll be able to go through with it because suddenly, on one of the days when we are doing an event, our nephew decides to get married. Oh, well, the, the, that becomes so, the priority. Definitely. That becomes the priority. <laughs> Family first. So you want the coriander in at the yes, end? Yes, sir. Yeah. In there. Now. Thank right. you. Okay. That goes in. So how long do you cook this for once you get to that stage? Well, we just need the thickness now. The mince cooks very quickly, as you know. Yeah. You can even eat it raw, so... But just a few minutes. And we've we got one that's, that we've done over here. So if I take that to one side... That's yeah, they put that it down done. right low, let it cook. Because Your mashed potato... Put some seasoning in there. ...is now ready. Yes, sir. So I'll let you top it with the mashed potato. But that's, that's just to recap, that's got your potatoes, it's got some eggs, it's got some cream, got butter, salt and pepper, the crushed cumin, and it's yep. got some coriander and some chilli, green And it's chili. looking amazing. It is absolutely yeah, delicious. Yeah, bags of flavour in here. It's mm? tons of, yeah. This... I said there's bags of flavour in both. So. That's what you want, isn't it? Of yeah. course. No, no, absolutely. But, but it's a different way of doing it, which uh, is very yeah, interesting. Exactly. You know? And that's why it's good with a classic. You can alter and, <coughs> and mix absolutely. different things with it to, to give it another dimension. I think it's great. And then hot oven. For hot what? Hot oven. 20, 30 minutes? 20, 30 minutes. 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. And we have Lovely. one. If I bring this out, happy with that? I'll put that one in. Yes, sir. We've got some plates. We've got a plate at the back so you can serve it on. And I'll bring this out. And you can see this. This looks amazing. Look at this. Wow, look at that. Aha! Look at that. <laughs> I mean, do I have no, to good taste good. myself <laughs> because of the spices? <laughs> The flavour, the smell, the aroma, smell everything goes well. Of course, it yeah. absolutely sm it's it just, smells it's amazing. It's just the strength, I'm a little bit... A bit uh... What, it's the chilli? Would you like some, monsieur? <laughs> I will try it. Can we put some more green chilli for you? Or... <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I know, that'd be, that'd be fine. You know? I guess the, the way it is, it'd be just perfect. Thank you so much. It's delicious, isn't it, that? Yeah, look at that. So, so simple. But that's the, I mean, the key but to, key key to your food, I'll, I'll let you do another one, I'll let you yep. put, put another one up. But the key to, the key to this is the simplicity, you know, that's the... the... simplicity is actually all, always difficult to achieve. The, that's the, no, it's because also difficult to achieve for an Indian cookbook. Not for you, no, the but I mean... Is, yeah, because, also, because, you know... For some people, they people find simplicity. People think that we use 5,000 spices. No. And they cannot, um, you know, they get confused with cooking. Yeah. So yeah. the idea is to simplify recipes and make them as easy for the home cook to be able to duplicate it. No, well, of course. this is what you're a master at. Cyrus Tollywood, everybody. Done. Yeah. Thank you. So remind us what this dish is called? It's called the Ginger Country Captain. Delicious, isn't it? Yeah. Very nice. And uh, the balance. Right amount of spice. Yeah, absolutely. What about that one chilli just in the mashed potato? No, actually, actually, I can take it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's a good job, because that's all you're going to get. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There we have it. Cyrus, everybody. Yeah. 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 Right, Daniel will be trying to top trump that dish a little bit later on. I'll be giving you a masters in haddock. That's coming up very shortly. But join us again after the break when we get more expert foraging advice from the one and only Alicia Vasey. I'll see you in a bit. Today's going to be special. Welcome back. Now, I'll be chatting some more to madness legend Suggs later, and I'll be giving you some recipe ideas for haddock in this week's Little Masters. That's coming up next. But first, I'm here with the two chefs, Cyrus and Daniel, and we're about to get a lesson in seasonal produce that won't cost you a penny from top, top forager, Alicia Vasey. Yeah. What, you're looking fabulous. Look at you. I know, I don't get me told you Look at oh, Exactly, nice. look at you. <laughs> exactly. And what are we talking about? We've got about sort of, what, three or four things we're going to talk about today. Yeah, not a lot. And while we're, while we're talking about that, is not that I'm going to create a little dish with one of them that we'll talk about. we have actually both of them at the end. But where are we going to start with this time of year? Right, well, it's slim pickings, James, round at this time of year. Right. Right, it's still early on, 
All right, but what we are doing, we're starting off with a bit of colour. Yeah. All right, and we're starting off with magnolia. So magnolia trees all over the country are just starting to come out in bud and then they'll come into flower and they're absolutely fantastic. So first thing I'm going to say is, when I go through this, is when you're going to pick your magnolia flowers, wait till they come out. Don't pick them off trees, because they really look lovely, don't they? Wait yeah. till the sort of, like, end of the life, stick a little branch in your carry bag, give it a shake, and all the leaves will drop off naturally before they hit the floor. Right. So it's, it's just waiting for that point. So what we've got here, so it comes in three colours. So we've got white magnolia, pink magnolia, and purple magnolia. So these are the pink ones. And I genuinely think, right, yeah, the flavour is... Fantastic. Did right. you know you could eat magnolia? Yeah. No, uh, I didn't. I know them, like right. you said, they make a liquor with it, but... Uh, you, make it, you make a liquor out of it in India? Mm. Right, okay. Right, that's a nice clean one for you. Clean okay. one, okay. So we get the dirty ones. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, got, I got you two Absolutely. nice ones there. <laughs> so there's one each, one each yeah. for you there. So this is in the raw form, so we're thinking potential, right? right. We're thinking yeah. potential. But I know so you're going to need some off roses off So what I'm hoping you're going to get, just stick it in. Just get, like, get it over and done with. Right, OK, oh. is, yeah, I know. Extra bit of... Ginger. Yep, ginger at the back, yep. How weird is that? How weird is that? Now, they're a little bit stringent at this time of year, so it's you've got... It's quite strong, isn't it? It's very strong, really strong. So you've got that astringency, OK, which I know is like leaves you a bit wow. of an aftertaste. It's extra bit of... Yeah, and, and it's the ginger flavour that yeah. really comes through. Good for Did diabetes. you expect that? Did you expect that? I didn't anticipate that at all in terms no. of flavour. Did you? But that first is a big aroma. Yeah. It's just a beautiful fragrance. You can think, you yeah. can find that in perfume almost. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's, and there's that heat yeah. that comes through and you're thinking yeah. there's like ginger things going on. I'm not surprised they use it in Indian cookery, you know, because anything is strong flavour and, and it's just, and it is, it's just, it's just beautiful. So what you're looking for, the white ones are a little bit less. But yeah. they counteract that astringency. So obviously to counteract astringency, so I've made a magnolia, like it, we can use these in dessert. So to use magnolia, what I would say is like a really nice creme brulee, actually, mm -hmm. you right. know, yeah. with a bit of magnolia compote at the bottom. It's, it, it's dead easy to do. <coughs> and a lot of people pickle, pickle magnolia leaves, mm -hmm. all right? And then you get that ginger and it just I guess that, because that'll counteract the bitterness. Exactly, yeah, yeah. the mellow. I'm eating it all day, and it's OK. You know? I want... Yeah. Would so, you do that when the... <laughs> not the yet. <laughs> but just, give it ten minutes, you yeah, might be. <laughs> just as they're about to fall off, yeah. right? Because they, they, do, they don't last very long, do no, they? They open up it. and then they start to fall. Yeah. So, so what have you done with what have you done with these? All, all you need to do, right, so this, this is basically magnolias with icing sugar and a, just a drop of cream. And the cream neutralises the astringency. So if you just do your chef thing, just don't back of your hand. You know what I mean? Just honestly, just a smidgen. I'm cooking something in a minute. I'm going to get onto this in a minute because we're going to get on and use it for the next two ingredients <laughs> that we've got oh. over here. So, yeah, this just, is. Just, just so you do what have you done with this? Ice and sugar, right? And a bit of cream. So the cream counteracts the astringency. That's unbelievable. Do you like that? What is that? Is that just blended that? Yeah. Literally. You don't, you don't that. dry them out? And I tell you what, this, it was this size. That's, see the right? weeds change wow. from the flower to the. It's interesting, wow. eh? Yeah, because it, it's about that. What can you do with it? It's all right. It really is in Indian desserts, no? Yeah, for brilliant. Creme brulee. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Creme brulee. Yeah, best thing ever. Right. Love it. Do you like that? That is really clever. That is that is, and that's just just, just just get this right. People can take oh, these. I know what you're doing. You want me to tell you how to do it, so you're going to do it later. No, on. just blend right. it with ice and sugar. That's it. Literally. Ice and sugar and a drop of cream, because the cream... You know that? Right, so when I gave you the petal, yeah. you got the ginger and then you got that <laughs> at the back of your throat, the astringency. This, the, the, the milk just takes out the astringency. Okay. Yeah? yeah. Neutralises it. It totally neutralises it. You see, Ralph, Ralph likes yeah, this yeah. part of the show you, as well. Can you, by any chance, infuse this flower or there's no reason coming out of it? Yeah, you can, yeah. You can, yeah, you can, influ you can infuse the flower, but you do tend to get a bit of astringency. And the problem with processing the flower, like if you're going to boil it up, mm. you lose the flavour as of well. Course, yeah, and the so, colour. So, yeah, so you don't want the astringency to come through. So it's best for milk-based things. You know, it's that, it's that okay. thing about... It's, it's, it's alcohol, isn't it, however... I'm going to say that, that you've been on the show for years. That is the nicest thing. Thing you've managed to bring with you and, and surprise me. <laughs> now the other things have been nice, but that's amazing. I would proud of that's for amazing. That. Honest to God, right? Yeah, that jar of manky lucky sauce, right, and all the things I've done. <laughs> that is amazing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Honestly, I, I have I have done my best over the years, right, to bring some nice I'm stuff that's right, a yeah. good thing. And I bring a jar of sauce down, and he's like, so "You're all over many, it like a rash." How many flowers for this small? It literally was that. For that. So where are we going now? Then we've gone from that. 
Right. Tell us about these then, because right. these are what I want to use for this as well. So. Okay, these are, these, are, these, these are great, these are great. So, it's elder, so when you're walking around the woods and you've got like fallen elder trees, yeah. all right, that's what you're looking for. These things, these are jelly ears, okay, and they are... To be fair, they look really horrible, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> you, right. don't, you don't walk around fields. You don't walk around fields and think well, to not yourself. Well, not as quite, not as pretty as that, are they really? But yeah, you know. no, we start off with pretty stuff. Yeah. Right, and then we just just go downhill from there, right. really. So, right. so these are little. These are jelly ears, and they are a parasitic mushroom that infects elder, mainly elder. And then what they do from there is they will keep coming. So you get rain five days on from there. Go in and look, and they will be decaying an elder tree. So you, if you get like last year, it was really wet. Really? So you can keep these going all year. Now, what you can do is you can either cook, strip them up, and um, put them mm. in a stir fry. You can actually just cook them as they are. Have yeah. I seen these in sort of Chinese supermarkets? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of this type of thing right. out in China. In but Japan the, as well. Yeah, it? yeah. The, it, like uh, in France, I was uh, asking you earlier, but I think. Uh, it's a cousin of the, of it the is. pig's ear, isn't it? It is a cousin of the, the, the pig's ear. is a little bit harder and a little bit more defined. And less membrane. Yeah, and less membrane, yeah. 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 I mean, to be fair, they, they, they feel colour. awful. Mm -hmm. They do. But this, this, right, is a genius thing because what you can do with these, and which we've done, is yeah. you can dry them out. And sometimes they dry out on the trees, so sometimes you come off the fresh ones and the ones that haven't been picked before are still on the trees, but they're in the dried format. Mm. Pick those as well because they've been naturally dried out. And this gelatinous state, once it's dried out, it's taken all the moisture out. So you've yeah, basically, fantastic. this is like nature's stock cube. Which yeah, well, I'm going to yeah. use for yeah. this, funny enough. Cool. Brings us perfectly onto this. In here, I've got some monkfish, I've got some clams and some mussels. Mm. So often with clams and mussels, oh, the yeah. liquid is quite wet. So what I'm going to use is some of this to thicken it up. All right, OK, well, is that it? crack on. Just a little sprinkle. So that's no, dehydrated, that. basically, yeah? Well, just... Yeah, it's... Just, it's a dehydrated... Going. Not, I don't want to thicken too much. Well, it's all right. It'll take a bit of a while, won't it? Because you've got to... Okay. Right. You've got to it's not going to just do it instantly. It's so not just like dehydrate a, them, it's, it's, not, it's not like those... It's not gravy granules, you know. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So all you've done with this is dry it all out. And yeah, dry it all nature. out. But I tell you what, as yeah. well, it's really good. It's got quite a neutral flavour. Oh, yeah, it's got quite a neutral flavour to it. But if you just put a little bit of salt in it and then just do it as a dusting light. It just really get really earthy to thing on top of your mushrooms afterwards. And then one final thing that we're going to talk about, which we have to talk about now as well, wild garlic. I, you know what? I, I, you know, all chefs, all this time of year, will be thinking, all right, yeah, wild garlic season. We know, we know everything there is to know about wild garlic season. Apart from sometimes you've just got to remember a bit of the history behind it as well. Because let's just think back to when the Romans invaded, all right? Yeah. It was mostly woodland was this country. Yeah. So if you think of the A1 and the Great North Road, what they did was they sent people forward, planted wild garlic, and then wild garlic is quite specific because it will go one degree latitude, and then two weeks, another degree latitude, and every two weeks it'll start coming up. So if you're going to put a giant army going up to Scotland, you need to feed that army. Mm. What do you feed it on? There's no, there's no fields, there's no sheep yeah, or sorry, cows, sorry, okay, right? Yeah. So they, start, they plant ahead, so they planted ahead. So every two weeks, as the army was moving up, they get fed. Mm. There's something to feed them with. No, wow, really? That's, a, that's, a, yeah. Yeah. that's amazing. I never you, knew that. It, he's, yeah. He thinks he knows everything about history. Yeah, that's that's ah, bustling. Yeah. So this is, this is in season now. The it's season in, lasts from when to when? Well, this is the thing, you see. So, like, down in Cornwall, it will start, uh, obviously, down south, it'll start, like, January, February time. And then March time, it, it needs more light. So after, you know, like, you're looking around the spring equinox, everything gets cracking, yeah. right? It's not bothered about the weather. That's why it was such a reliable crop for them to do. And they could put that in the woods up along the great marching routes and then take themselves forwards up the country. So as they got further and further up, it was still coming through. So at least they had a base vegetable because it's absolutely full of everything that you'd need. Yeah, so so they would use that as a vegetable? Yeah. yeah Not for flavouring season? No, 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 no. I mean, th th they'd have been on rations, you know? I mean, yeah. it would have been hunting and shooting in the forest. Like a spinach or mustard. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. what you find, because people say to me, oh, Alicia, I've, I've put some wild garlic in my garden and it just doesn't spread. 
it takes forever. And you'll find that mostly in ancient woodland where it's like carpets of the stuff. Yeah. But if you overpick it, I mean, you've just taken the leaves, never mind the roots, other things will come in and take over because it's very slow to sort of like reproduce. Mm. So you've got to be careful with it. But that's what they did. Every two weeks it comes up, every two weeks you're marching away, you've got to go to mm. Scotland. Oh, no, well, I mean, let's face it, you're going to live off wild garlic for six months, but you'd be right, won't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you can utilise the flowers as well. You can yeah. also, the great thing about this, you can dry it all out, you can blend it in with butter, it'll last uh, exactly. throughout the rest of the year. It is actually and magical. And also, stuff it's, well. got, it's, got chemi right, it's, it's got a fascinating chemical composition that will tenderise meat as well. I feel like I'm surrounded by brain cells. And in amongst it, some wild garlic. Correct. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I've just mixed together a nice little bit and of fish stew with gorgeous. mussels, with clams, a lovely bit of samphire, some wild garlic, and some of this amazing mixture just thicken it all up. But there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, the brilliant Alicia Vasey, everybody. Yay! Superstar, superstar. Uh, right, Danny will be cooking for us very shortly. He'll be serving up uh, a show-stopping dish for us. And I'll be doing a cock of art at the end of the show for Suggs a little bit later. But nice. I'll see you after the break for a little mask glass in haddock that you don't want to miss. And I'm going to use smoked haddock as well. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Now we're treating singer Suggs to a cock of our race shortly and chef Daniel Galmish will be taking over the kitchen duties. That's coming up next. But first, it's time for this week's mass class. And this week, I thought I'd take a look at one of the greatest fish you'll find in the seas around this country, and that's the humble haddock. And it is absolutely spectacular, this fish. And there's so many things you can do with it. And two of my favourite things of what I've got in front of us over here. Firstly, the Arbroath Smoky. These come from Arbroath, not to be confused with the, the Finnan haddock, which is very similar. Um, it's smoked fish with the Finnan haddock, slightly bigger. But what they do with the fin and haddock is they coal smoke it. This is hot smoked, and this is absolutely beautiful. It's got a PGI status, which means that it has to come from that area as well. Our broth, it's absolutely amazing. The lucky people of Scotland will know this because it's absolutely delicious. One of my favourite, favourite ingredients in the world, this. And what we do is we just, to warm this up, because you can buy these online, you can just take some newspaper, like that, over like that, Wrap it all up, sit it on a tray, and sit it in the oven. Done. And that's just going to get warmed up. It's as simple as that, really. You can then turn this into... Uh, you can do uh, uh, omelettes and omelette Alan Bennett, which I've done on the show, which is amazing as well. And another one with the smoked haddock, so I'm going to get on with the fresh haddock in a minute as well. The smoked haddock, which I want to get on here. So I'm going to poach this smoked haddock, because every time I do this, it reminds me of two things. It reminds me of my granddad, because that was the only thing he was allowed to cook in the kitchen, that and his new potatoes from the garden. Poached haddock with a little bit of milk, but also the late, great, the genius, Mr Gary Rose. And one of his most famous dishes, as well as bread and butter pudding, used to be this dish. And it, it is just spectacular. It really, really is. So this is naturally smoked haddock. This is smoked haddock that's been smoked using a smoker. You can do that, you can smell it. it smells amazing. All we're gonna do with that is we're just gonna poach this in a little bit of the milk. So you're just gonna sit that in the milk in there. Now, with this, we're gonna turn this into a rare bit on the top. And the rare bit on the top uses some cheese. So we use some cheddar cheese. That's gonna go in here. Now you can use the poaching liquor from the fish as well if you want, but a little bit of milk. And then I've got some Henderson's, that's going to go in there. A touch of Tabasco, that's going to go in there. And then we've got some mustard. Now, English mustard for this one. So I'm just going to use some English mustard. You can use the powder if you want, but just a nice little bit of English mustard. Good dollop of that. <coughs> it's hot and spicy, is English mustard, so just, just be careful with it. And then using a spatula, we're then just going to melt this. All together. Now, the most important bit with this, we don't want to boil it. If we boil it, it separates the fat from the cheese. So when you're doing this, just melt it gradually. That's what we want. Now, while that's happening, and we've got the fish, fish cooking away nicely, and this just melting away nicely, I can talk to you about the main haddock as well. And the majority of haddock this comes from sort of the northeast of the UK, caught around the northeast, all the way up to sort of 
Uh, Norway, around us, the Russian border, that sort of area there. And the other part of it, it's only two areas, really. The other bit is Canada. Um, but it's a fantastic, fantastic fish. It's kind of like the cousin to cod. But with this, it's the, the other cousins in the group. You've got whiting, curly, uh, a little bit of hake. The key to this, really, when you get it really, really fresh, and that's important with all fish, of course, but when you get it really, really fresh, sometimes it can be quite pappy, as in uh, quite soft. So what you want to do with that, and I get in the habit of this really when I'm cooking this simply with fish like this, particularly from that side of the family, not necessarily with cod, but from this, is you slightly salt it. <clears throat> so you just take the fish, sprinkle it with a little salt. I'll just show you, just on this bit. So you just take some table salt or some sea salt, just over the top, and you just leave that sat there, and it just firms up the flesh on the fish. So when you cook it, it doesn't break up. Now, I've got one here, and I can actually feel it sort of firmed up a little bit. And you can just take your nice little bit of fish like that. Now, if you want to season it, another way of doing it is take a little bit of black pepper and do it on the underside, skin side. I always like to leave the skin on, really. It just holds the fish nicely together. And we just take that and pop it straight in the oven. That's going to cook nicely in there, only for about three or four minutes. Meanwhile, over here, we can then turn our attention to our nice little bit of rare bit. So if I pop that over the top of a piece of fish, it's basically just going to fall off. So to hold it all together, we take a bit of flour. Now, make sure it's nicely melted like that. You just take a touch of flour, not too much, and we just mix that together. Now, keep the pan on the heat, and it'll actually start to thicken up. There we go, it's starting to come together now, a little bit. And that, maybe a little bit more flour, not much more than that, that's all you need. And mix this all together. Then what you want to do is you want to allow this to cool slightly. Then I add an egg yolk or two, a couple of egg yolks, something like that, in there. And then let it set on a tray. And if you let it set on a tray, it goes into that. You can put it in a bowl if you wanted to, because what this ends up doing is it's a bit like sort of... Uh, pastry, you can actually end up moulding it. And it's brilliant over fish like this, but it's, it's absolutely delicious, this. It really, really is. And to simply cook it, we're just going to take our tray again. A little bit of butter over the top. You've got a lovely bit of fish, which is just, just cooked. Now, the reason why I don't fully, fully cook it, you can see that, is that it's going to go under the grill and cook even more. So. I'm not going to thoroughly cook it. This milk is brilliant, by the way. Keep this, because it's brilliant for omelettes and things like that. It's fantastic. Take your nice little bit of cheese. And look at that. This gives you, the, like, the ultimate cheese on toast if you wanted to. You can take this recipe and you can then put it on a little bit of bread with a bit of chutney, which is delicious. And all we want to do is just cut this. And then you sort of put... You can put that bit on there. Sits on the top of there nicely. Another one. And that sits on there nicely as well. So don't forget, it's going to melt anyway, so it's going to cover it all up. But this is brilliant. It lasts in the fridge for a good four or five days. So once you've made it, you can do so many different things with it. Like I said, for breakfast, on a little bit of bacon and some chutney and some bread. It's just, it's ace. Pop it under the grill. And that's going to sit on the grill for a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, I'm just going to check our fish, which is happening. And then I'm going to do a little garnish for this. So this is nice and quick. So we're going to do these really, really simple. We've got Alicia on the show as well. We've got samphire you can get. You can get this from the supermarket nowadays. I'm going to make a lovely little simple little sauce. Very, very quick, very, very simple. We take some shallots. I've got some mussels over here, some clams. I've got some tomatoes. And we're going to make a really, really simple, simple little garnish to go with our nice little bit of haddock. Tomatoes. Like that, I've taken the skins off the tomatoes, but nice and quickly, we're going to bring all this lot together. So a hot pan on the stove, a little bit of butter, like that, into the pan. In we go with our tomatoes and our onions. That's going to go in there. In we go with our clams and our mussels. These have just been cleaned. They're going to go in. Bit of white wine. Get the pan nice and hot. There we go. Touch of cream. A little bit of that. Some samphire. 
So this is beautiful, nice and salty. So you just want a nice amount of that in there. It's just a really simple little garnish to go with haddock. Touch your black pepper. Pop the lid on, that's going to be about a minute. So the dish for the smoked haddock, the rare bit, which is looking really good. We take our tomatoes like this. So these are the ones that have been skinned and you just slice this all up. Now, if you wanted to, you can serve this with a dollop of chutney. It's entirely up to you, but just sliced tomatoes like this on the plate, ready for our rare bit. Really, really simple. As I say, whenever we're doing this sort of dish, it just reminds me of the great man, Mr. Guy Rhodes, because it is just fantastic, is this? It really, really is. I had the fortunate experience of eating this at his restaurant when he was still alive. It was just, it's just magical. So salt and pepper over the top. Grab yourself a little bowl. The dressing for it is just chives and olive oil. That's it. So take some fresh chives. And then it's looking really good. Fresh chives in there. Proper olive oil. I can switch that off now because that's done. Touch of that. And then you just spoon the olive oil and the chives over the top. And then the fish, I can tell, is ready. You just take this straight out of the grill. Look at that. It's just... It's a dish that makes me smile because it's got so much history with this as well. But look at that. This on the top. It really is a classic. If there's any chefs watching this, of a certain age and a certain era, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when you're watching this. Because it's just classic. This one over here, we're going to then lift this out. That's your nice little dish finished. Haddock's perfect. We can then lift this off. This is a simple little sauce. You've got the mussels, the samphire. I mean, look how easy that is. It's so versatile, this haddock. You know, so often we think of this as just as fish and chips. Then whenever you go up north, when you ask for one of each and a bag of scraps, one of each meaning fish and chips, it will always, always be haddock. Never cod. And we just lift it off like that. And so we can then lift off our nice little bit of haddock over the top. Sits there with it. Beautiful bit of fish that's slightly salted because it firms up the texture nicely. And then finally, because we can, and we've got one more dish, and we've got time, about 15 seconds, I believe, <laughs> is we've got our, our broth smoky, which, trust me, if this was, people say, what would be last meal on earth be? This, probably, and longestines, this. Um, and just have it like this, in newspaper. I just think it's one of the most magical, magical ingredients there is. And you just open this out, look at this, and you have hot abro smoky with butter, like that, and you just pick off the flesh like this and you just eat it. It is just absolutely delicious. One of the finest ingredients, I think, in the world. And now you know how to cook it three ways. There you have it. Had it done. Yay! Right, if there's anything you'd like to learn about it, Little Mouse Gas, then do get in touch. we we'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break. But join me again in a couple of minutes where Mr Daniel Galmish will be here with some amazing recipes, this time for fish. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now I'll be making a sensational cockabout for all my guests, including Suggs, very shortly. But first, I'm here with Cyrus, 
And he's about to put his feet up and enjoy a dish from a Frenchman who's got more Michelin-starred kitchens on his CV than anybody I can think of. It's the fabulous Daniel Galmish. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank well, you. thank you for coming as well. And, and looking at this, this is... If it's not classically French out of this, with a little twist. With a little twist. With Absolutely a little, right. little bit of chili. Yeah, because a classic uh, skate wing, we do with a, a bit of uh, butter, parsley. Yeah. Which is one and, of the best and capers, things in the and world. I love that's it. That's Bernoisette. Yeah. Classic, classic. But Kate's skate can take chili a little bit, can take a okay. little bit of lime. So I decided then let's do a small twist on that. I guess this way. gentleman <laughs> would be very happy about it. So yeah. we're going to, yeah. you want me to do the potatoes first? So yes, please. I know yeah. you want to get the skate. I want cooking. to serve it, yes. So a little bit, yeah. So skate, I, I mean, I've got this in the restaurant, and I, it's hugely popular because when it's in season like it is now, it is absolutely spectacular. Yes, at the I moment, this. it's perfect. Yeah, it, it's absolutely amazing. And, and the key to this, I think, is, is to do it simplicity-wise. That's the that's the most important thing, don't you think? Yes, definitely. With this? Definitely, yeah. And uh, as all food, when it's done simply. I think it's very nice. Yeah. yeah. So salt and pepper. Do yeah. you flour salt. it or not? You don't need to. No. Flour it. No, no okay. I don't. And what about yourself? I mean, you do dishes like this in India. Yeah, right? plenty of skate in India. Yeah. Goa is very popular. They make a curry called ambo tik, right. which means hot and sour. Okay. <clears throat> and it's cut into smaller pieces, of course. Yeah. With the bone on. I didn't realize that. You see, so which is interesting. Yeah. Huh? You get massive skate as well. You know, you get huge ones, and for that, because it's tougher. So the sour comes from what? Is it tamarind? The sour comes from uh, palm vinegar and tamarind, both. Right, okay. So right. tamarind is slightly sweeter, so yeah. palm vinegar and tamarind. All right. And of course, heat from the blend of chili. Got it, right. So seal it off in a little bit. Now, the great thing about this is people often think, what am I supposed to do with it? Just simply seal, seal both sides, finish yeah. in the oven. And, and it's going to take, what, no more than four, four or five all minutes? All, toge the all together with the pan fried, about eight minutes. Yeah, that's I it. Think, I think that's it. Really? Yeah, that's it. So you and, get uh, nice... This one is a little bit thick. It might demand one more minute. It's possible, but I think it should, it should be. And we've got to get a nice little colour on this first. So in with the potatoes, you want some a parsley? A little bit of parsley, a touch of chilli. A touch of chilli? Wow. I mean, now we're pushing the boat, aren't we? Because okay. as a Frenchman, I don't too much do that, but uh, it can take it. And then and you uh, just basically cook those, and we've got one here. It's like a three-quarter cook, and after that, a nut of butter. A bit of the chopped chili we're going to put there. Which we're going to do in a minute. Because I know you yeah. want to concentrate on the fish that we've got over here. Yeah. So you mentioned the fact that classically I do this with bernoisette, which is just a little bit of nut brown butter. Which and uh, with capers. Yeah. A bit of... Or you do grenoblas, which is another one. Grenoblas you can as well, yes, absolutely. With fried bread yeah, yeah. and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, which I love as well, yeah. Yeah. Would you put uh, do, is sultanas with that? Or you put raisins with... Uh, sultanas with grenoblas? Do you soak the sultanas? Or, or... I don't... Uh, that's a good question. Why not? Yeah, it's it's sort of, I've, I've had it with that as well. In yeah. France as well. Yeah, we just sit and peel the little grapes. You yeah, know? some people just yeah, use the sultanas. Yeah, blanche, peel them and then put them in. Yeah, or you soak the sultanas with it. But it's not yeah. yeah, no, I never had that, But actually. it tastes it really well with it, with the nut brown butter, but... Well, yeah. what, what is good with that with that uh, fish, it can take quite a lot of, uh, of strength yeah. as well. So you can see, I mean, what, you know, it's almost halfway cooking, almost up with the fish. It's nice and simple. Almost, like yeah, yeah, almost. Sometimes you just dead in that corner there. Yeah. It can be a little bit uh, raw, so you need to be careful. And if you worry about what's in it, there's just like a little cartilage in it. Really. A bit of cartilage. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not amazing. Not a main bone. It's not a so. chunky fish like that. Yeah, you just to, to eat it, you sort of scrape it from top to bottom, don't you? That's it's, it, because yeah. that's why it's called the wing, isn't it? Because yeah. it's more like a wing. Yeah. Look at that, it takes color very easily. Yeah, we now you want it in the oven, don't you, so Yeah, I'll oven. Put, I'll put that in the oven for you. And we're going to do... That's but, got uh, yeah, If you can chop some chilli for me, it would be amazing, quite right. thin. And you want me to drain these potatoes as well, do you? Yes. Right, yeah. that's those. So you're making the chilli butter? Yes, chilli and uh, some uh, garlic. Some garlic, of course, I need to keep the French part going <laughs> by putting some garlic, you know. But, but your I... training, you're classically, classically French trained. You, you come from an area of, for Comte, yeah? Yeah, this France is, Comte, yeah. yeah this which is, is that, that area? That... East, east of France, yeah. 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 And uh, which side is that? Is that the Comte side or the other side? Is it Lake Alice? I'm, I'm more on the side of the Vosges Mountain. Okay, the other side. The other side, yeah, yes. 
which one day, which one day, funny enough, I was talking to, Ray, to Raymond Blanc, and he said to me, he said, I don't know the speciality of your of your region. I said, you you live in the same region. He said, but your side, I don't know. It's <laughs> it was, it was only a hill. <laughs> it, was, it was quite interesting. And uh, but you, I mean, like I said, amazing, amazing restaurants that you've worked in. I mean, sadly, the Gavroche closed recently as well. You worked there. Oh, I mean, when it when it did close, it it did uh, it did. Uh, kind of feel really strange to me. Yeah. Because I was a really young boy when I was in London. That's what I was talking about earlier. So you must have been and there with Albert was behind the stove. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Right. And you didn't see him coming quite a lot of time. Yeah. So uh, this you, was before the not... this was before the poking of the stick, was it? Yes. Because yeah. I used to get the stick in the ribs a few times. Oh yes. Yeah. Well you had that too. Oh, yeah, okay. I got that, yeah. Well I'm great. I'm not the only one. <laughs> exactly. Here. Yeah. So yes. you're just going to blitz that up. That's, yeah. Is a little bit of garlic in there? You put the garlic in there. Little bit of garlic, yeah. Okay, uh, so garlic, lime. So you might wish. Am I that doing... one. On, on button. There you go. That's good, that. That's kind of it, really. Yeah, wanna, that's wanna, kind wanna, of it. I'll give you a spatula. Here you go. I'll use a spoon there. Mm. Merci, monsieur. There you go. So the great thing about this butter as well, you can actually make it and then you could freeze it if you wanted to. Yes. Yeah, like you do for Bermet d'Hotel or you do for Montpe yeah. Montpellier butter, which is another butter which is yeah. made with anchovy, which is absolutely superb as well. Now, do you want me to you want me to fry the potatoes, but not in not in that butter, just in some normal yeah, butter? Yeah, just a normal bit of butter. Okay. And a little bit of the lovely chili you just made there and a touch of parsley. Okay. And that's all. And this one. Just for a little bit of colour, these potatoes that are going in here as well. Yes, that's it. Thank so, you. So when, what, what took you to Scotland then? Because Scotland was one of the first catalysts. You end up getting a Michelin star in a hotel up there. So what, what took you to Scotland? Well, actually, a lot of people don't know that, but I came in UK by default. In a sense, when I, I was hoping to go to Sweden. A lot Swe of Frenchmen say that to me. No, because I was hoping to go to Sweden. Right. And when I applied for my visa to go to Sweden as a young guy, they stop taking foreign people. I don't know why. It's, <laughs> it's fed on me, but no, it's because that's after, what they uh, told you. Because after the Kosovo War, they had yeah. a lot of uh, um, right. immigrants from Yugoslavia and all this, and after they stopped. And so by default, I came here and I had an interview in Paris in a restaurant called Coco de Mer, which is a restaurant from Seychelles, who yeah. was a cousin of the guy I was going to work with. And my interview was in Paris to go to Scotland for my first head chef position. And, and I ended up in Scotland, and that's where we have our first Michelin star. And at that time, I was only 18 in UK. Yeah, that, that and was I was many. six in Scotland and, uh, and 18 in, uh, in England, tw 23 altogether, that's all. Yeah. So right, we put so that in here. So I've got, I've got some chili, I've got some parsley yeah, that I'm chopping up as well. That chili there a little bit. Yeah. And then the skate is just, that's how quick it is, it's cooked. That, that's now ready. I, I can, you can tell that if you just press this, yeah. just Start. starts to break a little bit, you can, you can see. it be just perfect. It's perfect. And a little bit of parsley in here. There you go. Very freshly done. Okay. And now we're going to use that and that. And we're going to melt that. Hands hot, chef. So yeah, yes, I was. That's why I had the cloth. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to just finish it off. Make in sure, the butter. finish it. Yeah. So if people don't have a food processor at home, how would they make the butter? Well, you need to do it by hand, the classic way, eh? or with a spatula in a bowl. I mean, that looks beautiful, though. Look at that. Yeah, and uh, and that's what what you want as well. It's just so those those color to remain on the top there. You don't want it to overdo it. And that's it. That's all. You're not bad at this, chef, are you, really? Well, I'm... You should take this yeah, up for a living. A bit of practice there, I think. Eh? It's been a bit of practice. A bit of practice. I think you'll get there in the end, you know. But as you know, as you all know, God, when we cook, if we are not gourmand ourselves, we cannot cook well, do we? Of course not. Yeah, uh, but you uh, managed uh, you manage to cook Michelin star food, but you managed to cook brilliant, simple food. And that's the key to it. That's the key I, to it, is uh, that you love each one as much. Yes. Look at that. But everything, James, always take me back to my classic. Yeah. Because uh, it's, it's the way my mum used to cook, my great aunt used to cook. Yeah. But, but that's the reason I use always recipe for my book, because it's all classic. Yeah. And I love it. And I love it because you're not frightened of butter. Neither of you are frightened of butter. Frightened of butter, no. There's no life without butter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, so, you're, telling, you're telling that to to people who love butter. And it's interesting you put the chilli in while it cooks as well, a little bit of spice while it's cooking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And it's great because the skate will take so many great flavors, like I said, from from capers to anchovy. It takes so many it amazing. It can take so much stuff. Yeah. yeah, can take so much stuff like that. Yeah. Voila. So give us the name of this dish. Oh, it's a pan roasted skate wing with a, a chili, garlic, and lemon butter, and just buttered potatoes. I've told chili. you it was good. You've just witnessed it. Daniel Garmisch, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>
when I used to watch people on the ground playing, including yes. Elvis Costello and all these people. This was where? In central London? In London when I was, uh, in, uh, I was uh, in Lower Snow Street, in the Gavroche. One of the few Kings places Bo that liked us for France. <laughs> 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 you told me, yeah, you were, in the 70s, you went to see him. Yeah. yeah, 77, 78. But amazing, isn't it, for a 45-year-old man to remember back then? <laughs> 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 uh, you're very kind. <laughs> I'm glad this fights my good hair. <laughs> So this currently is your 13th, 13th album, this one. And, and how special it is. We listened to it a little bit earlier. Thank this, you very much, James. This must be... Uh, you must be chuffed a bit with this. I, you know, I am. I think it's the best stuff we've ever done. Of course, you do. Everything new you do is the best. But you've been very kind and you're embarrassing me slightly now. What's the story with the Helen Mirren thing? Where does that, where does that come in? Because that's, that, that's something to do with the album. Where, where does that come in? Oh, God, yeah. So, yeah, I've got an house in Italy, all right? Face up, yeah, 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 like all the <laughs> teachers, two Bob North Londoners have got a place in the Mediterranean. And I just discovered that down the road from my house, which is in Puglia in southern Italy, was Helen Mirren, and through a friend of a friend, I got to know her. And it was quite funny, because it was when she was doing the film The Queen, and I was sitting on the beach, and I knew she was coming round to meet us. And I said to my mates, look, just don't freak out, the Queen's coming round the corner. <laughs> and just then, Helen Mirren came round, and two of my mates literally fell off their deck. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she was, yeah. No, she's a lovely person, and I asked her just to read out some of the lyrics of our new album for a sort of promo. And you never know, but she's always up for it and funny, you know, and hilarious. Yeah, so. yeah. That's oh, legend, legend. So, like yourself, look, look. We've got some lard on, I can't see. Yeah, really? yeah, you got, yeah that can go straight in, Jeff. Very good colour. Yeah. Straight in, get it in. Pour in. Yeah, get it in, no messing Ooh, around. Very good yeah. colour. So that all goes in. The great thing about this, you put, you, you can fry the lard ons if, if you want, but this is going to go in there. I'll bring this all over. But your lard ons go in. Now, you can do this a variety of different ways. I've got the little book of Ghani, which is basically just parsley stalks, uh, bay leaf, some fresh thyme. That's going to sit in there. And then I like to put the mushrooms straight in. You use yeah, small yeah. white yeah, mushrooms in France. Yeah. So yeah, I just small white. He looks a little bit... Small, the, the, yeah. Yeah, he starts to twitch when I did that. He <laughs> wanted to chop them all up. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> That's true. Because <laughs> I thought the size compared to the one we use. Hey, I said... You think this is bad? I was going to get Cyrus to do this bit with me. And just leave you sat there. <laughs> Go and get some from the garden. That would have really, really winding you up, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's like a... It would have been proper twitching. So what you do then is you cover it over. If you want to cover it over, you put it in the oven. I like to cook it yeah. in the oven or...? Oven. Oven's Yeah, best. absolutely. So oven for an oven. hour and probably yeah. an hour and 15 minutes, something like that, and what you end up with is your classic, Ooh. what I class as brasserie, brasserie yeah, cockaban. Absolutely. Cockaban that's not been messed around by chefs and de deconstructed and put back together and all, no. all manner of different no, sort of stuff like that. <laughs> it shouldn't. So, uh, sorry? Why would you deconstruct a cockaban? Trust me, because chefs... A lot of people do it. <laughs> chefs do it, don't they? They deconstruct yes, they it and mess around with it like that as well. But as well as the album, we've got to touch on the tour because, you, I mean, you love playing live anyway, and there's no better band, I think, than live anyway. But you... James, I love you. Thank you for remembering why I'm on this programme. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from eating cockaban. That, that's why I've been doing this for about 30 years. <laughs> no, no, you know, like... <laughs> so, yeah, but exactly. tell us, but tell yeah, us about... What was good is my um, promotional person over there said, you're going on tour in March. I said, no, that's America, mate. No, no. <laughs> no, we're actually going on tour in June. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. And we're starting in Southampton just down down the road, yeah. and I don't know Portsmouth and all that. So we're on tour for about two or three months, yeah. doing festivals, race courses and all sorts, and it's tremendous that people oh, still want to come and fun, see yeah. this old shower, you know. Well, yeah, it's great, because... So, there's, I mean, because are you it's... doing a Newbury races as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> Not because yeah, I'm yeah. there, so that's what I'm asking. Are you there? Where <laughs> you can oh, exactly. Look, we're just going to... They'll tell you which ones we're at. Are yeah, we at yeah, Newbury? Yeah, yeah. Newbury. Are we at Newbury? <laughs> You're all over the UK. Yeah. yeah, but that, yeah. What race? Oh, well, OK. Are uh, you at oh, Newbury no, races? No, 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 he said, I'm all over the UK. Yeah, we won't see him again. OK. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Okay, right. Do, you so want, I, do you want to season that, Chef? Oh, yes. You, so, yes, yes, yes. Season it with salt and pepper. So, you like to... put some in here. You do this with mashed potatoes. I do this with mashed potatoes, but you do so this... Hang on, yeah. only an hour and a half. Yeah. That hasn't been no, no. overnight or no, anything. No, no, no. It's been overnight in the, in the wine and everything, but... Yeah, yeah. And then you've got proper mashed potato. Ooh. Yeah, we need a touch of seasoning in here. Touch of salt and pepper in there. There you go. I'll let you... Let you chefy season it up. <laughs> go on, then. But I, I actually think... Sometimes, is it too salty? 
Sometimes I've and had cocker van. You blame the chef. Yes, too. because uh, the the pancetta you call that. The pancetta, if I did too much salt, too salty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so that's the reason, and he still seasoned the. Uh, the chicken oh, as well. Check it, yeah, yeah. Sucks. check it, it sucks. Check it, it sucks. Take another yes. taste. No, I don't want to do any. Don't, yeah. don't want it. Don't want it too salty. Cook with salt. I don't, <laughs> want to, I don't know what he's all about. Yeah, that's enough. It's happy with that? Yeah, yeah. That's good. Go. And then we just oh, lift this off. Yeah. yeah. And I actually think when when people do this and deconstruct it, they try and get the sauce too thick. Ah, uh, it shouldn't be. I think you uh, just gotta. Yeah. You have it. Because nice. when it's too reduced, it's not good. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta have it nice and simple like that. Oh. Happy with that? Yes, yeah, it's a hefty portion. And there we have it. It's a hefty portion. A classic, yeah, classic. Yeah, that's perfect. Hefty portion. Well, that's classic, proper classic. Proper brasserie dish. Brasserie, cocovan. That's it. Easy as that. Cooked Whoa. by a Frenchman and me. What can you say? Done. There you go. <laughs> <laughs>